So Sam, over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now I'm a teacher just like you guys. You're going to hear my story in a bit, but hands up, who agrees with that? That it's easy to build strong children than to repair broken adults? All right, awesome. Thank you so much for your hands. And put your hands up again if today you'd love a simple strategy just to connect with young people and build new skills of empathy. Hands up if you want that. Okay, cool. We're in the right room. Thank you so much. Because this is why we're here today, as Paul alluded to at the start, the gap between ourselves as teachers and young people is widening. Now, I'm originally from the UK. I've lived in Portugal now for 18 months. But the reason why we're here is because we are facing a massive epidemic when it comes to mental health. Now, back home in the UK, some students take two years to get seen by a counsellor. And 70% of mental health conditions are established by the age of 18. So that's why we're in the room. And today you're going to learn at least one thing to take away that's going to impact your life but also the lives of your students. Now, how we do that, with the business, we use coaching and the power of coaching to transform lives. And today, we're going to show you a few of those techniques. And what you're going to be able to do is just to implement that really fast. The staff that were on our training last week said that what they enjoyed about it was the information, but also how fast they can implement. All right, we're going to do a little check-in now. So I work with lots of students on anxiety and confidence. And what I'm going to give you now is a little strategy. So if you've got a pen, can you write out the word CALM for me as an acronym? Just down the page. So it's a little exercise we can use to check in with our emotional state. And it's actually a great way to build emotional intelligence with people. Now, when you're listening to a student or when you're listening to someone share, a little tip to build emotional intelligence is to just check in with yourself. What emotion is this person I'm talking to actually feeling? So first tip for today, when listening to someone, you want to build emotional intelligence, ask yourself what emotion is that person experiencing right now. But for you, I want you to write down for the C, how are you feeling right now? And just to write that down in a word, it could be tired, happy, sad, whatever, just write that word down for me. Now, in my sessions when I work with students, I'm a trained uh, teacher in meditation, and breath work and meditation has been a really important part of my life, especially when I was dealing with my own emotional struggles, which I'll share with you in a bit. Now, there's loads of breathing techniques out there. You've probably heard we have 70,000 thoughts a day. Loads of thinking, and the majority of those are negative. So in a second, you're going to take a big, deep breath into your nose for four seconds. You're going to hold it for four seconds. You're going to exhale for four seconds. And then we're going to hold for four seconds. All right, so everyone with me, if you just want to exhale. And then inhale, two, three, four, and hold. Two, three, four, and exhale through your mouth. Two, three, four, and hold. Two, three, four, and inhale. Two, three, four, hold. Two, three, four, and exhale, two, three, four. Once we've done that, the L stands for love. I'm bringing in more self-care into our lives. I want you to just write down for me on the gratitude, who's one person in your life that you're extremely grateful for? Write that name of that person. Who's the person you're really grateful for in your life? Just write down one person for me. The last part of this CALM acronym stands for MOVE. Now today I'm going to be talking lots about action. You see, we've all got the person that we want, we've got an image of the person we want to become and the person we're currently being. And the gap between that is action. And this is why coaching works so well for young people. It's all about those action steps. So for the MOVE, it's like checking in with, what do I need right now? What action step can I take right now to improve things for me? And that's what we're doing with coaching. We're building these action steps for students. It's fast, it's effective, and it's in the present moment. So there's a little strategy right now. OK, thank you so much. So this business has been going for six years. I've trained teachers in Cuba, in China, in Argentina, uh, here in Lisbon. But it wasn't always like that. And I'm just going to share my story with you. And as I share my story, just listen for the insights and how it lands for you. So this is me at 10 years old. Give me an R. 
Give me a bigger R. Aww. Okay, that'll do. Cool. Uh, this is me at 10 years old. Now, can you go back to what life was like for you at 10 years old? Now, my mum, bless her, she dressed me up in these Harry Potter, Potter glasses. They had HP on the side. <laughs> and as a result of that, and other things in my life, I didn't feel that confident as a kid. Think back to what life was like for you at 10. Now, when you were 10, you probably looked up to one person as an inspirational figure. Could be a teacher, a parent, a sports coach. I looked up to one man, and I still look up to this guy, and he's my dad. Now, I was very shy and anxious as a kid. My dad, full beard, tattoos, Royal Marine commando, fought in the Falklands War, submariner. <laughs> so we're very, very different. Now, if you've got a pen, can you just write out the word belief for me? Just write out the word belief. I haven't got a flip chart. Now, in the word belief, you'll see, if you can highlight, there's the word lie. Can you write that down? Just highlight L-I-E in the middle of belief. <coughs> now, if you're a primary school teacher, this is really important. A lot of the beliefs we have about the world are formed between the ages of zero and eight. I took on this belief to get my dad's love. I had to be a soldier. In 2012, I achieved my dream. And I got a letter through the post that changed my life. And I knelt down to pick up the letter. And I was literally shaking with excitement. I had a big red waxy stamp from the, uh, the British Army. And I cut through the red wax. And I read the first line. And it said, Sam, we'd love to have you in the Royal Anglian Regiment of the British Army. And welcome to your training. And I ran over to my dad at 21 years old, gave him the biggest hug. And that little boy, I finally felt that like my dad was proud of me. And he loved me. But team, can you think to a time when life wasn't going so well for you? I'm not just saying a little bit sad. I'm like, maybe one of the worst days of your life. Can you just picture that for me? Two weeks after this, I've been really struggling with my health. And I didn't know what was wrong. Two weeks after this, I got another letter through the post. I knelt down for this letter. Same for the army, didn't think much of it. Cut through the wax. Said, Sam, unfortunately, you have failed the medical for the British Army due to your diagnosis of Crohn's disease. Now, I had no idea really what Crohn's disease was. All I knew was that I couldn't follow in my dad's footsteps, make my dad proud of me. And I collapsed onto the floor at 21, hugged my knees into my chest, and I cried. And it was one of the most at the time, darkest moments of my life. I had this new like, medical condition. I'd failed making my dad proud, and I didn't know what I wanted to do. Now, my dad was a soldier. Guess what my mum was? A teacher. <laughs> Can't follow dad, I'll follow mum. So I became a history teacher in a state school, a government school in England. And I took all of this pain with me into the job. And I hated it. Now, I didn't hate the, the students, I didn't hate the school, but I hated myself. And I had this big dark cloud over me that just developed into chronic insomnia. It then developed into anxiety, to the point where I was so anxious I couldn't get into school and teach. I felt like such a failure, such a victim. And the turning point for me was in 2015. I was teaching a room of year 11 students. And there was a girl at the front, her name was Susie Clark, always remember her. You know those students you remember? Susie looks me dead in the eye. She asked me this, Sir, are you okay? And I said, yes, I'm fine. Now grab your pen. The acronym for fine, feelings, write this one down for me, invitation, feelings, inside. Feelings inside, not expressed. So I said, yeah, I'm fine, Susie. Now, the student asked me this question in this moment of hyper-anxiety, and I'd been, I hadn't even been to school for three days. I'd just made it in, and she asked me this question. I grabbed the whiteboard pen, and I spun around the room to pretend to write on the whiteboard, because I've started to like, have tears rolling down my face. And crying in front of a group of year 11s, 
like, not a good look. <laughs> but it was the turning point. And as a result of this, I thought, I've got to get some help with my mental health. I got sold the old toxic masculinity cocktail, right, of pull your socks up, boys don't get sad, boys don't show emotion. But I found someone that changed my life. On the 23rd of April, 2015, I met a coach. Now, I'm big into sports, mainly football and cricket. And I thought, this is just a coach for, I don't know, is this what a coach is? But this was a coach for my mindset and how I felt. Now, I opened up to this guy. The one thing I learned was to express, not suppress. It was like taking, like, releasing all this pressure. And like the beautiful sunny day it is today, where I'm from in Milton Keynes, not quite as nice as this, um, I took, I was walking around the park and for the first time it was technicolored and vibrant. And I went back into school and became a much better teacher because I dealt with my own pain. I dealt with my own issues. But as you know, as educators, I started to see so many students that were struggling. And I got angry and frustrated with it. The biggest value of this business is rebellious because we want to stand for something different. And I saw so many of my students getting let down, let down, let down. So I thought, well, I could become a therapist, a counselor, and I became a coach. And in 2017, I became a qualified coach and made a little business called Student Breakthrough. I was coaching kids. This guy's called Jamie, by the way. Now, Jamie, great little story about the power of coaching. Jamie had been school, ref well, we called it, the school were calling it school refusing, but he had so many challenges, he couldn't get into school. And Jamie, when he was 14, had one way to walk to school and another way. One way was to school, one way was to, br to a bridge. And Jamie was so low, he'd been so let down by the wait list for support that he decided to walk the other way. The first day I met Jamie in this coffee shop was the day that he tried to take his own life. Now, I'm not a qualified psychotherapist, and he got extra help. But what I was there for Jamie was, I was a heart with ears. I connected with this kid. And now he runs his own amazing Instagram account to help other people with their mental health. And that was one of the first moments of, man, coaching is where it's at. This is how it can help young people. And then I worked with primary school students as well. And trained older sixth form students in coaching. And large talks and big assemblies to students. Now, around this time, people were saying, Sam, can you train me in what you do? Richard Branson once said, say yes and make it up later. <laughs> so I was like, yeah, I can train you. Yeah, I can train you. And I started to train teachers on the program. And teachers were then using this to help the students. And I was like, wow, this is making a big difference. I'd have been lucky enough because of this success you know, we've had in, in small areas to be featured on the biggest newspaper in the world, Northampton Chronicle. <laughs> Slightly bigger, BBC, which is a good turning point. Here I was talking about teacher burnout. Um, on the news, obviously very prevalent. We've trained teachers in the UK and now in Portugal, Spain, China, many countries. And some of you might recognize this amazing group who came to St. Julian's to deliver this training. Now, when I was speaking to the students last time, I had the mic in my hand and I was almost shaking because six years ago, I was a high school teacher struggling with my mental health even before then. Maybe 10 years ago, I was in that place. And now here I am in Portugal uh, with you lovely people. So thank you so much for listening to my story and hopefully that sets the scene around about why coaching is important for students but also for yourselves. And that's the invitation for today. Yes, learn how to better support the kids, but also learn how to better support yourself. Because we can't transform the world alone. Now today is not going to be probably groundbreaking for some of you, and that's okay. Changing education, changing mental health support is like moving a huge mountain. But one of my favorite quotes is, the person that starts moving a mountain begins by carrying away small stones. And if you can take one thing away today, like the ripple effect that drops into the, pe uh, the pond and the ripple effect's out, then that's a massive blessing. We'll just go through this quick. Um, but this is why coaching really works for young people. On the right-hand side of this, you've got therapy. This is our talking therapy continuum. Where does coaching sit? On the right-hand side, you've got therapy. I've got a great therapist. We talk about me as a little boy. That's about it, right? We have a nice chat about the past. 
I'm also a trained grief recovery counsellor. Now, counselling really does work for students and all of us. When I work with students on counselling, we go to a specific part like bereavement, grief, loss, and we deal with that. This is where we sit as teachers. On the right-hand side of this, we've got consulting, which is giving your opinion as an expert. A lot of us are teachers in here, so we are experts in that subject. I'm an expert in history, I'd like to think. And then we have mentoring. Again, which is guidance. My friend over there said about guiding, but also giving your opinion quite heavily, I think. Now, coaching is the sweet spot. If you've got your pen, coaching lands for students because it's in the present moment. Number one, it's not digging up the past pain. It's very fast to action. And you can get results really, really fast, really quick. When I started coaching students back in the UK, I was working with a really disadvantaged group of boys that had totally switched off from school. If I was there asking them, well, why don't you like school? What's been going on for you? What's, what about the past? It didn't really help. The coaching was like, right now in the present, what can we do right now to make things better for you? So in coaching, there's loads of different tools and exercises and strategies. We've got some of the teachers doing the coaching program that are in the room. But I'm going to share just one simple connection point when it comes to working with students. And this is our breakthrough basics. So invitation, you just want to draw out this triangle for me in your notes. It's not a dance move, but it could be. Just draw out the triangle. Now, the whole thing we do as coaches is underpinned by the skill of listening. On the side there, we've got questions. And on the right-hand side, we've got silence. Now, this bit is so, so important. If you can just take this one thing away, and it might be a reminder. It might be something you've heard before, and that's cool. It'll be a rediscovery for some, or actually a new discovery. But the thing that underpins everything we're coaching, or any talking therapy that we had on there, was the skill of listening. Hands up who knows who this is. OK, if you don't have your hand up, then don't know where you've been. Um, <laughs> This is obviously Nelson Mandela, probably regarded as one of the greatest leaders ever. And I choose him as, listen, as, a, as a person to think about with listening because I never met the guy, but in the research I've done about him, he was a great leader because everyone felt really valued and heard and understood and respected in his presence. Now, if you didn't know, Nelson Mandela's dad was a tribal chief in Southern Africa and used to take little Nelson Mandela along to these meetings. And Nelson Mandela remembered two things from these meetings. The first was that everyone in the tribe was sat in a circle so they could see each other. The last thing he found out was that his dad was the last person to speak. So he understood this skill of listening. And in his work as a leader, he made people feel this way with his presence. You might think he's one of the greatest leaders ever. He'd be telling, but he was asking. Now, most of us have been given the gift of hearing. Now, hearing is a physiological phenomenon, right? Most of us can hear. You're probably he hopefully you're hearing me right now. But here's the distinction. Listening is a psychological act. So hearing is a physiological phenomenon. Listening is a psychological act. When we work with students and young people, we train people in, you can call it active listening, breakthrough listening. We call it breakthrough or level two. And that's like putting a single spotlight down on the person in front of you, bringing all your awareness to them. Maybe how they're breathing, how they're moving their body, and maybe any key words they're sharing. Because the biggest communication problem we face in school and outside of school is that we simply listen to reply. We don't listen to understand. So what would happen if we start to listen to understand, then not just reply, just think of the impact that would make? And my favorite, one of my favorite phrases I love is becoming a heart with ears. So taking your heart here, putting it on your ears, and really feeling that person, becoming the most empathetic listener you can be. Now, as teachers, we never have time. I know I've been there. <laughs> Checking in with a student and working on your listening skills doesn't take much more time. So alongside listening, becoming a heart with ears, we've also got the skill of questioning which we all use as teachers, just going to show a little distinction here around questioning. When we work with young people, you want to build connection. You've got to get curious, like an archaeologist here, and dig for the truth. We said that the issue is not the issue. We can uncover the issue by questioning. 
Now, when I first started coaching in, in coffee shops in Milton Keynes, I was like, oh, I'm a coach now, right, cool. I'm gonna ask some why questions. And I asked all these students lots of whys. So why, why, why? And I got a lot of responses like, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. Because the why is super accusational. It's like, Helen, why have you not taken action? It's like, whoa. But can you see if we change that first word to what? What stopped you taking action? It's way more subtle. It's less accusational. Young people can get on board with that. It's way easier to answer that and build connection. And the how question there is the action. For me personally, when I was when I, well, learning how to coach and teaching, the last thing of my conversation with a young person would be, you know, how can you improve things? How can you get better? What can you go away and do? And that's the action on the how. The last part of our Breakthrough Basics is silence. And I love this saying here that silence cuts through the noise. We've got emails going off, we've got everything going on in teaching, and we try and give solutions really quick to students without giving their space. One thing to be mindful of, if you can give students just one or th even three seconds more silence, they've then got the opportunity to share, and it might go off on a totally different tangent. But we're so quick to give our opinion, give our advice. I once had a coaching session a few years ago where the guy asked me four questions in one hour. And I was there like squirming in my chair. It was super awkward. But in doing that, I, I dug for the truth. I found out loads more about myself. It wasn't coach or teacher led, it was led by me. And again, how can we help our students lead themselves? How can they be the leaders for their own lives? And silence is a great way of doing that. All right, we're gonna round this up. So my favorite quote, I've got lots of quotes, but this one from Gandhi is one of my favorites, that happiness is when what you think, what you say, and what you do are in harmony. But how many times do we think we're gonna do something Say we're going to do something, and then we doom scroll Instagram or binge Netflix. Hands up. <laughs> I do it as well. I do it as well. Now, a simple way to improve your mental health or your confidence is this, and it's to stick to your word. When we stick to our word, it builds self-trust, and it builds an inner belief that we can actually be responsible. OK, well, just before we finish, Thank you so much. <laughs> Sit down, Paul. <laughs> I'm not done yet. <laughs> it's Friday afternoon. It's a lovely day. Thank you so much for giving me your time. I, I mean it so much, and I'm very grateful to all of you. And it's not just flippant remarks. I genuinely believe it and mean it. And remember, it's easier to build strong children than to repair broken adults. Thank you so much for your time. <laughs>